Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's Mike here at Game for Scratch, and the wait for Godot 4.4 is over. And I'm going to start things off with a somewhat possibly controversial statement. I think, in my opinion at least, this is the best release yet. It's been that way with some software. I think uh, Unreal Engine 5 was probably the best release there. Uh, Blender 2.8 was the best release. Doesn't mean it's the best version, but in terms of releases, this is the one I am most excited about. And frankly, it's because of a lot of small quality of life details. So we're going to jump in and take a look at Godot 4.4, what you should be excited about. And let me know what you think of this release down below. By the way, we're going to use assets available from uh, this particular Humble Bundle going on right now. So if you're interested in picking up the assets we're looking at today, I will have a link to that down below. So we're going to use a couple of demos from this example. Uh, and right back here, this is the New York example. And I'm going to showcase a couple of cool new features. Now, the first one is this. And this looks like a little thing at first, but it just changes the way that you work. What I've done is I've just picked anything at random from the properties or the inspector window here, and I favorited it. And what you'll notice here is you now have this favorites category. So if you have all these things that you use constantly, let's say, example, for some reason you used mode uh, from process all the time, you literally favorite it and it will always be there. So you select something else, they're still there. They're at the top. They are favorited. This is going to be, again, just such a time saver for people that work with the same things all the time. A lot of times I could see it being uh, transformations that get pinned up there, um, materials, textures, that kind of stuff that you access all the time. By the way, if you want to get rid of something, just click it again and then unfavorite it and it is gone. It's like a little thing like that. It is going to, again, be a bit of a game changer for how you work with things. Another thing that we've got going on here is this. So I'll oh, pull this in from off screen. Like so, I'm going to go ahead and create a camera. And right now, that camera is created way over there. So I'm going to do is bring that camera back. All right, so let's grab the, the handle here. Oop, whoa. All right, here we go. So there is our camera. Bring it over here a little bit and up. Now, positioning cameras has always been a bit of a pain. So now my camera is in the scene. Well, what you'll notice over here, this is a preview of your camera. So if you're positioning your camera in the world, it is so much easier now uh, because as you have it selected, you just basically drag it around. By the way, if I resize this window, we get a bigger preview going on for it. So it's going to make positioning cameras in the world just so much easier. There were ways to fake this. Like you could do a viewport and then v dedicate that to the active camera. Uh, but this just works so much nicer. If you have multiple cameras, it will uh, automatically go to whichever the selected one is. Uh, again, just one of those little quality of life things that I think is going to make a huge deal uh, for people using uh, Godot in general. So I like that one as well. And another graphics thing that we've got. So let me just go back up here to this scene and go to the top. A very, very top of the scene, find my world environment. And a new thing that we have in our world environments is a new tone mapping system. And this is actually a pretty important one uh, because a lot of people that work inside of the Godot game engine use the tool Blender. And the default tone mapping in Blender now is something called AGX. So here you can see the results of AGX, uh, at least on this particular scene. Uh, we can change the exposure up and down. Again, it's a way of shading. We already have... Um, Aces, Filmic, Reinhardt, and Linear, but now we have AGX as well. And again, the cool thing with AGX is this is the tone mapping default from Blender, so you should be able to get your scenes to look much more consistent when they use the same basic tone mapping. So here we are. This is another uh, scene from that exact same Humble. Again, link is down below if you want to check it out. But what I can do now is let's just go back here to the top once again, and you'll see the results of... Yeah, let me just grab that, drag it to the top, flip this over, and let's see what the tone mapping difference is on this one. So we got this new, again, AGX tone mapping. There you see the results. I actually think things, I like um, Aces and Filmic better myself, but uh, that is, again, a new option available for you. And if you are working with Blender, you're going to get that nicer consistency uh, in place. Now, another thing that we've got going on, let me just drop something into the world here. So I just instantiated this fire engine right here. And now what I can do is uh, physically place things. So using the physics colliders in the world, using the Shift and G key, I move into physics mode. And see when I go over something that has physics on it, it snaps to it according to the physics. So it makes placing things around your world 
just so much nicer. So if you got to stack things and you've got physically placed objects, this mode is wonderful for you. By the way, that hotkey, that Shift G, you can completely customize it in the settings if you wish to do so. Uh, so again, another nice change there. Now, another one we've got going on, and this is probably one of the more massive changes. What you're seeing in here, this is uh, one of the physics demos out there. So I'm gonna go ahead and we'll go to one of the tests here. So let's just do uh, a box pyramid. So collection of objects, boom. All right, so nothing overwhelming going on there. Well, a couple things to showcase to you here. First off is this new window. This is the new game runtime window. And what I can actually do is select an entity in the world like so. So I can switch over to 3D mode here, pick something, and you can actually interact with it in the inspector over here. So see, I've got that little box selected right now. I can come up here to scale, change it to five times scale, and then let's just bring that preview window back up and there you're going to notice you now have a much bigger box uh, there are ways to pin this in place so you have various different options over here for how you actually display it uh, you can switch to 2d interaction mode so if you're dealing with like the test menu over here you'll see over here the uh, options for this populated 2d item come up and if you just want to go back to controlling your game objects you can switch back to input mode so you do have this new uh, game window which does enable you to um again, interact with running objects directly. Uh, and then when you close it, the, um, the changes you made were removed. So that, uh, for example, that uh, change we made to that box will be undone the minute I set it. So it gives you the ability to kind of interact with your objects even more. But the key thing with that whole physics demo is actually this. So come down here, we're going into our settings, scroll down here and find the physics, 3D. And what you're gonna notice here is the physics engine I'm using right now is the Jolt physics engine. That is very cool. So you can now have Jolt do all of your physics. And in the future, it is an, it's, it's indicated that Jolt is going to become the default or the de facto physics engine. Uh, and they're going to start supporting all of the things that Jolt does that maybe right now the Godot built-in doesn't do. So right now, at least, you do it in Godot 4.4, have Jolt physics built in before it used to be only done as an extension. That is a very cool development. And generally, you'll find Jolt performs just a little bit better. Now, another thing we've got going on, let me just go over here. And now we're going to go into the code editor. I'm going to show you a couple things with the code editor. First off, I'm going to show you probably the newest big change when it comes to the world of coding and GDScript. So let me just paste that guy in here. I've just created a new dictionary called my dick. And what you're going to notice about my dick is that I use two keys. One is an int and the other is a string. So now you can actually have um, named uh, value pairs inside of your dictionaries. So you can see here the addressing of it. So your dictionary, first value, second value, and so on. So with this guy selected, we go back over here to the test menu. Uh, you will now have my dick up here and you can edit the various different values there. So that is a cool new feature when it comes to uh, the world of GD script coding. And in the world of coding, we have another neat option here. Let me just go ahead and set a breakpoint in our world. So let's say uh, which one do I want to do? So on option select right here. So when we select a new test and go ahead to start it, we will run that. So I'm going to go ahead and we will run. And this is going to hit my breakpoint. Uh, so right here, go ahead, pick a test. We'll do the same one as before. So the uh, pyramid and then boom, I just hit my uh, breakpoint there. So now what we have is a new option down here called REPL. Now REPL stands for read, evaluate, print, and loop. It's a way of basically interacting with your code. So right here you see we are in this one. It has this item path set in as an example. I could say item path and it will go ahead and print out what the value of item path is. So you see right here, boom. So if I wanted to say instead, I could go uh, item path equals Bob. Uh, okay, I did that wrong. Should, should be able to do a direct evaluation. I might be might be screwing something up in this demo part, but uh, you do have this runtime interaction with your variables. So you can do these on the fly evaluations of various different, it's probably my error over here. Um, so, oh yeah, so I just wrote bad code. So don't write bad code and it should work better. But you do now have this evaluator built in so you can interact with your code directly. And while I'm here, uh, one more thing to showcase, and I think this is the last thing I'm gonna demo before we go over to the release notes. Uh, if you hover over something, uh, such as, uh, so let me just, let me just get out of here and we'll hover over ready. See that? 
you now get these pop-ups or tool tips that link into the documentation. So you don't have to go to the documentation to find out what's going on. It just does it for you. Definitely another nice improvement there. So there's a ton of new features in here that just sort of just make your life better to work with it. And then there's a couple things I haven't really touched on. Like for example, we have new metal renderer. Uh, by the way, once again, all the demos we used here were available from this bundle. Link is down below. Let's go ahead and check out the release notes here for the 4.4 release. Now, again, we, we covered on a bunch of them, but there is, there's even more here. So again, we now have Jolt Physics now in. So this used to be as a GD extension. It is now built in out of the box. And again, I do believe going forward, I, I um, mistakenly said in one of my beta videos that right now it's the default. This is going to be a thing at some point in the future. So you actually have to turn it on uh, in that physics settings. We also, again, have that new uh, embedded game window that we saw where you can actually interact with your game, see how things are going, interact with them in the inspector. Very cool feature there. You can even change things on the fly. Uh, you also have uh, interactive in-game editing, like we saw a little bit earlier on. Uh, Uber Shader got updates. So Uber Shader is a way, it's kind of like a giant shader that loads in initially, keeps the, the shader hitches from uh, happenings with like the little micro stutters when you first load a shader. The Uber shader has got improvements to make it so that stuttering is less common. Another neat thing that you can do with 4.4 is you actually create your games directly in VR. So if you have an open XR headset, you can actually create and author games in VR. The Godot editor has actually been ported over to VR. So currently it's supported on the Quest 3, 3S, and Quest Pro. So if you have one of those devices, you can actually create your game and test your game directly inside of VR. On top of that, we also have 3D physics interpolation. Uh, so you can see the direct result of it. It's basically, it's smoothing out between the calculations. So in your physics calculation, your physics in general should just be smoother. Uh, on top of that, we do have the new AGX tone mapping. So it's a new tone mapping algorithm. Again, it's uh, from Blend Blender, uh, so their filmic tone mapper was replaced with AGX. A uh, Godot implementation resembles theirs closely, but is purposely simplified to be more suitable for real-time use. So it's not going to be a one-for-one -one shot, but it's going to make it look a lot more like what you would see uh, when you use Blender, which is good because a lot of people do their development for Godot using Blender. Uh, then again, we also now have type dictionaries. So again, if you want to do like name value pairs or whatever, you can do that now. Uh, they're coming to Godot, impacts the core engine, GD script, and all other scripting when inter um, interfacing with Godot's dictionary type. Inspector UI uh, or UX was updated, so you saw where you had that drill in, so you could actually edit those values and see them and so on. Uh, and then we have a number of improvements, things, of course, like optimizations, which people like. That's another thing I like about this particular release. A lot of it is like hardening improvements in quality of life, which I appreciate all of those things. One of the things that they have done is uh, change the way the file system works. I think they'll talk about this later on, so this isn't that. Uh, they've replaced the uh, library for the um, constructive solid geometry, uh, so they're using a third-party tool instead of their own implementation. Uh, should be stable or hopefully run better, better support going forward and so on. You also now have the curve editor. The curve editor can actually go between, it used to be limited between zero and one. Uh, so if you had your game, you would then have to convert it to a different value if you wanted to use a curve. Now you can set those curve values for whatever you want. So you can see a curve going from zero to 10 as an example. Um, and then we've got um, scene tree um, system was improved. Again, more performance improvements there. And this is what I meant to talk about earlier on. So for everything that doesn't have a universal ID, there will now be one generated for it. So you'll notice after you open your projects up, the UID files will be in there. It's a way of making it so you don't kind of uh, ever have a, a, an unreferenced file or something to that effect. I'm not 100% sold on this change, to be honest, but it, it's something that they have done. As I mentioned earlier on, we do have the 3D physics snapping. Uh, this can be controlled. You can switch it from uh, Shift G to whatever key you want. It is available in the settings. Very cool there. We saw the new expression evaluator, so that is using REPL. Uh, so it gives you ability to do like kind of on the fly debugging type stuff that you couldn't do easily before. The favoriting of uh, uh, items, again, I think that is a very cool feature that is going to make a, a huge change for a lot of people. Um, 3D camera preview, again, uh, this, this section right here is just uh, game changer for some people's workflow for sure. Uh, we did see the, the tool tip pop-ups with the, the documentation there. 
Uh, shadow masks for light map global illumination. So now on, you don't have to choose between fully baked or dynamic shadows anymore. Enabling shadow masks while baking your light map is now possible to use static shadows in the distance and dynamic shadows close up. Uh, it will now persist your uh, window position. So if you're using, um, you know, if you if you save it and exit it at a certain size, it will come back in that same location. Startup seeds, startup speeds for scene loading was uh, sped up up to three times. Visual shaders got some improvements. Auto starts for all profiles. Uh, error list first project import. So sometimes you used to have to open a project up and then it would have errors and then you had to open it again to fix those errors. That stuff has been fixed uh, or mostly fixed anyways. Uh, and then for tool developers, there is now an export tool button annotation available. Uh, platform options. Did you know that Godot runs on Android? Because it does. There is a full Android editor. And now that editor has export support for a number of different platforms and a number of other little improvements there as well. Uh, we've got some improvements for Linux and Mac OS as well. Mac OS actually got two pretty big updates. First off, improvements to the controller support. But the biggest one here is this. They now have a metal rendering back end. They used to use something called Molten VK, which was like a, a, an adaption layer from uh, the uh, Vulkan API over. Now th they've got metal uh, directly and it should actually uh, get better performance as it goes, but is limited currently to ARM devices, which is pretty much any device released in the last three years, I think, other than maybe the iPad mini. Uh, on the C Sharp side of things, we have an upgrade that used to use mono. Now they are using .NET 6. .NET 6 is shortly going to be replaced with .NET 8. Um, so that is in the next release. Uh, so uh, definitely nice to move off of mono because that is basically a developmental dead end. Uh, and the cool thing with this is as they keep current with .NET, it's going to keep your C Sharp versions um, up to date as well. So I think C Sharp 8, maybe 9 is in .NET 6. And then .NET 8, we will have like C Sharp 11 or something to that effect. So definitely nice improvement there as well. And C Sharp projects can now support all... Um, Android ABIs or binary interfaces, uh, the, the various different APIs that are available there. Uh, improvements in animation, including a new look at modifier 3D. You can see it in action right there. And we have jiggle physics. I don't know what you would possibly use jiggle physics for, but I'm sure some of you can come up with some ideas. Uh, animation markers allow you to create subregions of an animation that can be jumped to or looped without playing the entire animation. Which is kind of funny because sub animations was actually a big part, of, or slotted animation, uh, was a big part of the newest uh, Blender release, which I also think is version 4.4. Uh, we have runtime support for wave files. Previously, you could only do this with Aug Vorbis. So if you need to load in wave files at runtime instead of you know pre-compiled with your game, you can now do so. Uh, we have faster uh, imports, including the usage of the Betsy texture compressor, uh, customizable animation imports, uh, navigation. So we've got uh, background checks for async navigations and improvements to the legacy code. Physics has... Uh, you can now have custom colors for your collision shapes. Uh, you now can turn on vertex shading and a rendering option, either on a material by material level or at a global level for your entire project. So if you're going for that whole PS1 retro look, you can use it there. Uh, 2D batching got improvements. So if you're doing sprites and want to draw them faster, uh, render driver callback. So in case you were trying to run Godot with the Godot Forward Plus or mobile backends on a device that does not actually support it, uh, does not support sorry, Vulkan, Direct3D12, or Metal, uh, you used to meet with an OS alert. Now there there is this fallback for OpenGL, uh, shadow caster mass property, very um, 2D shader instance uniform improvements, and so on. So we also have some improvements to the VFX as well. So yeah, that is a pretty packed release in my humble opinion. And again, I honestly think of all the releases out there, this is the one that is the best one to me. In, in Just because, again... I like type dictionaries. I like the fact that it's more... So we've had major releases, things like the first 4.0 release or the first 3.0 release, but those are almost always unusable just because of the level of you know bugs and the number of changes and so on. So you're you're waiting for you know a 0.1, a 0.2, a 0.3, or maybe a 0.4 release uh, before you can. And I think we're kind of getting at that point, but a lot of this usability stuff here, the runtime window, the um, ability to... Uh, have this uh, other uh, rendering system in there, the type dictionaries, the camera previews, all of the stuff combined. In my opinion, this is the greatest release of Godot 4.4 yet. But I'm curious, what do you think? Let me know. Comments down below. I will talk to you all later. Goodbye.